Thank you all for joining us today for this conversation about the present threat to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the polar bears that live there. My name is Amy Cutting. I'm the curator of the North America area here at the Oregon Zoo, and I'll be your moderator today. The Oregon Zoo has been community supported since 1888, and we've come a long way over the past 132 years. Our mission is to inspire our community to respect animals and take action on behalf of the natural world through advancing animal welfare, environmental literacy, and conservation science. One species at the center of all of these efforts is the polar bear. Because of the rapid retreat of the sea ice that we're seeing in the Arctic, it's critical that we have as much information as we can, as quickly as we can. We need to understand how polar bears are being impacted and how they are trying to adapt to a warming Arctic. Working with the beloved bears Conrad Tossel and then Nora here at the Oregon Zoo, we've led the way in using zoo-based research to support conservation science. Our many partnerships with scientists and other zoos have helped give us a better understanding of what polar bears need to survive in a rapidly changing world. We also strive to make this science visible and accessible to our community so they know what's at stake and what actions they can take for polar bears, people, and the habitats that we all depend on. Our discussion today could not be more timely. Just yesterday, the Trump administration's Bureau of Land Management issued a notice of sale in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. What this means is that oil and gas companies have never been closer to being able to drill in this important denning habitat for polar bears. Today, we'll be exploring what this would mean for the polar bears and the Arctic, as well as what we could all do about it. We're very fortunate to have two champions of science and climate action with us today. Oregon's U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley <clears throat> has long been on the front lines in the battle against climate chaos and in working to save our nation's great natu greatest natural treasures from drilling for fossil fuels. Among the many bills he's introduced related to preserving the Arctic, curbing climate change and protecting habitats from pollution is the Stop Arctic Drilling Act, which prohibits reckless, high-risk drilling that will accelerate climate chaos and devastate Arctic ecosystems, including those critical for polar bear survival. Dr. Stephen Amstrup, also joining us today, is Chief Scientist at Polar Bears International, a nonprofit focused on polar bear conservation. Prior to joining Polar Bears International staff in 2010, he spent 30 years at the U.S. Geological Survey's Alaska Science Center, where he was project leader for polar bear research, conducting research on all aspects of polar bear ecology in the Beaufort Sea. He led the research team whose findings convinced U.S. Secretary of Interior Kemp Thorne to list polar bears as a threatened species and as a past chairman of the IUCN's polar bear specialist group. Each of our guests plays a unique and critical role in conservation, science, and policy. Thank you both for being here. This is uh, really a privilege for me and for the Oregon Zoo. For today's conversation, I'll ask three questions of each of our guests uh, to get us started, followed by some questions from the audience. So please post your questions in the Facebook comments and we'll select some for the panel to answer. Okay, my first question is for Dr. Amstrup. My first question concerns the polar bear population that lives in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Dr. Amstrup, you have studied polar bears in this part of the Arctic extensively. How is that population faring? Well, I wanna give you some uh, background, Amy. First, uh, we have to recognize that polar bears feed mainly on a couple species of seals that they can only catch from the surface of the sea ice. They've spent 100,000 to maybe a quarter of a million years evolving the specialty of catching these seals. And we can think of the sea ice as essentially the dinner plate for polar bears. There's very little for them to eat on land. When I first went to Alaska in the early 1980s, I could stand on the beach at Barrow or Prudhoe Bay in the summertime and look out and see the sea ice right there. Uh, the ice over the shallow continental shelf waters where polar bears preferred to be was right offshore. And uh, if I was lucky, I might even see a polar bear hunting for seals out there if I had a good pair of binoculars. Now that ice is hundreds of miles offshore. It's beyond the curvature of the earth. If you're standing on the beach in the summertime now, there's no sea ice in sight. And due to this sea ice loss, the Southern Beaufort Sea population has become one of the most imperiled of all polar bear populations. In recent years, Cub recruitment has been only about half of what I recorded in the 1980s, and a recent paper documented about a 40% population decline. Wow, okay, thank you for that summary. Uh, my next question is for uh, Senator Merkley. You've been a key proponent of the Arctic Refuge Protection Act. In what ways will this legislation protect wildlife habitat?
Senator, I, I, my screen doesn't show you, but you might be muted. I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear the senator either. Okay, let's fix that. Oh, there there we go. At least once a week. <laughs> to, to everybody. I said wonderful <laughs> things about both of you. Uh, how what a joy it is to be with you, and uh, and to have you all in this this battle to to save the Arctic refuge and all the species that call it home. This incredible jewel. It was uh, in 2017, the first year of the Trump administration, that they passed a a massive tax act that gave away $2 trillion out of the national treasury, primarily to the wealthiest Americans. And embedded in that act was a change that allowed the oil and gas drilling uh, in the Arctic refuge on the coastal plain. So you have this pristine Arctic ecosystem. It's a, a national treasure, a home to some 250 species, caribou, migratory birds, uh, polar bears, of course, uh, for our conversation today. And what the Arctic Refuge Protection Act would do would create permanent protection for the coastal plain by designating it as a wilderness. Okay, thank you for clarifying. That makes a lot of sense, thanks. All right, my next question is for Dr. Amstrup. Why is the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge so important to these bears? What risks are posed by the Trump administration's plan to move forward with oil and gas lease sales in this area? Mother polar bears give birth in snow caves that they dig into banks of, of deep snow, into snow drifts uh, in the uh, fall, and then occupy those and give birth in the middle of the winter. The cubs are born blind and a, uh, totally helpless, and they're unable to leave the den until springtime when they've uh, grown enough that they have enough body mass they can withstand the harsh Arctic climate. Uh, cubs that are forced to leave the den prematurely are unlikely to survive. Uh, 20 to 30 percent of uh, the polar bears in this area choose to den on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge every year, and uh, so in order to protect these bears in this already imperiled population, the Fish and Wildlife Service dedicated and declared that the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge is critical habitat under the Endangered Species Act. Now the proposal that's just been released uh, calls for ways to theoretically protect bears from the kinds of activities that would be involved. And one of the most important ones that they've proposed is aerial infrared surveys, which can see some dens through the snow. But the industry record on that is not very good, detecting only about 45% of the uh, dens that were known to be in particular areas. Uh, and those surveys were done in areas with less complicated habitat than the Arctic Refuge coastal plain, and typically in areas where there's less snow than on the Arctic Refuge. So the likelihood of even a 45% detection rate is probably pretty low. Importantly, if you look at the language of the uh, uh, proposed incidental harassment uh, document, what you see is uh, that the calculations have suggested there's a 21% of either injuring or killing a polar bear during the course of these activities. And they concluded that this one in five chance is uh, not likely. But if we think about that, if you were playing Russian roulette, you have a one in six chance of killing yourself. How many of us would be willing to take that chance? Uh, in addition, the development of the oil and gas uh, resources that may be under the refuge would just hasten and contribute to the uh, ongoing global warming that is already threatening these animals. It's pretty clear that the science is against uh, the uh, development of these resources and in favor of uh, protecting the Arctic refuge from development so that uh, we uh, minimize the risk that these animals face uh, from such developments. Okay, thanks. I can see how with that kind of denning density, a detection rate of 45% is really not gonna allow you to find and avoid disturbing those maternal dens with any kind of consistency. Okay, thank you. Okay, my next question is for Senator Merkley. Um, some people might assume that the, the wildlife refuge designation makes the area off limits to oil and gas development. How did we get to the point where drilling could become a reality? And how has Congress been working to stop it? 
So uh, obviously this drilling is completely at odds with the, with the name of, of wilderness, of refuge, uh, but it is a result of that clause tucked into the 2017 tax bill. But essentially now what's going on is a mad dash by the administration to actually lease the lands before they're out of office. So 17 days ago, they issued a call for nominations, which basically means oil companies, what, what areas do you want to lease? And normally uh, they would in, wouldn't issue a notice of sale until 30 days after that. Uh, they did so yesterday, 16 days after that. That's cut, basically cutting that time in, in, in half. They announced the uh, sale would be on January 6th. That's a very short period of time from now. Uh, and they said that if you want to comment, obviously they don't really want comments. They're saying you have to do it by letter and it, your comment has to be in by December 17th. Uh, so that is uh, something I would encourage everyone to do. But if you think about that, the 30 days changed to 16, only giving a few days for comment, saying that it has to be by mail instead of online. And then uh, what they're doing is trying to, to get those the sale 14 days before the new administration takes office and use those 14 days to finalize the leases, which would normally take months and months and months to do, big complicated uh, leases and terms to be laid out and negotiated over. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's why we're in, that's really why we're holding this panel conversation right now because it's such a dire situation. And I'm hoping that everything possible can be done to obstruct this and, and enable the leases not to be finalized before President Biden takes office on January 20th. One of the things that a group of us did as senators, 15 of us, we wrote to 11 major banks to say, please uh, state to the public that you will not finance this oil and gas drilling in the Arctic Refuge. And this is a really a, a, a good moment uh, because just uh, yesterday, or last week, I guess, the Bank of America joined us as the last of those banks to say that they would not finance this drilling in Anwar, in the Arctic Re Wilderness Refuge. And so that's terrific uh, because a lot of companies would need to have financing. And it basically says to everyone who's thinking about buying these leases and drilling, there is a reputational risk here. A lot of America is not gonna be happy with what you're doing. Uh, and in addition, uh, we should apply the same thing to the insurance companies that would, would issue insurance for these companies for their various activities that they uh, might undertake. Uh, so um, there could be huge liabilities of damage done in this very fragile ecosystem. It's, it's a very different world than say drilling in, in Texas. Uh, and so, um, that also would be effective. I think it'd also be effective uh, for uh, Americans to say, you know, if you buy that oil, uh, you know what, we're not going to buy your gas that you turn it into or some other forms of uh, threatened boycott. Uh, so um, uh, that's, um, that's where we stand right now. That's why we're publicizing through this type of panel. Thank you so much for organizing it. Uh, and for the research you all do to help us understand that you all do at the zoo to help us understand in partnership with the field research like Dr. Emstrup does, uh, how we uh, save uh, not this, this pristine, beautiful uh, piece of the planet, uh, but also uh, how do we take on the challenges global warming is posing to so many species. And by the way, a big piece of that is we have to rapidly stop burning fossil fuels rapidly. And uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's, I know that's broader than this immediate discussion, but the reason the Arctic is uh, changing so fast as the doctor pointed out it is, those icebergs are, are disappearing offshore is because of the warming is accelerated at the poles. Uh, and so you're seeing incredible changes. In fact, there was the, uh, I believe the first ever recorded 100 degree day north of the Arctic circle uh, this winter. Uh, this year, so um, uh, this year, uh, so uh, big changes. We've got to work with nations across the globe, but immediately that this moment, we have to stop the Trump administration from issuing and finalizing this sale of leases. 
Great, thank you. It's it's uh, really excellent to see that kind of responsibility from the big banks. Um, and just to let everybody know, at the end of the presentation, we will be putting up a slide that um, gives you information on how you can provide comment, um, as, as Senator Merkley mentioned. So I want to be clear that we'll be providing that information at the end. Okay, um, in the interest of time, we're going to keep moving. Um, I have one more question for Dr. Amstrup. Um, what actions would you like the next administration and Congress to take related to the refuge? Well, first of all, uh, we need to protect the Arctic Wildlife Refuge permanently as wilderness area. Uh, the 1002 area, the, the coastal plain, was originally set aside for consideration for drilling. Uh, we cannot afford uh, to extract the oil and gas that might be under there for a whole variety of reasons. These habitats were designated as critical habitat for polar bears for a reason. Um, on sort of the bigger scale that Senator Merkley just emphasized is we need to invoke, as a country, we need to invoke policy measures that decrease our reliance on fossil fuels and increase our reliance on sustainable energy. Uh, fossil fuels, by definition, are non-renewable, so ultimately we would run out of them anyway. But we need to halt their use or dramatically reduce their use before we run out because of what we're doing to the climate. Uh, carbon taxes and a whole variety of other measures are possible. We need to focus on those kinds of measures. And to the extent that uh, we need to rely on fossil fuels for various parts of our economy, uh, we need to extract them from places that are less sensitive and less expensive to develop. Okay, thank you. All right, my last question for Senator Merkley, what are the next steps in Congress to both protect the refuge and take climate action? You alluded to some of that in your previous answer. Well, we hope that we will have a, a Senate uh, with a majority that is willing to put the bill into committee, uh, debate it, get it to the floor, get it to the House. That very much probably depends on the elections in Georgia coming up on uh, January uh, 5th. Uh, we need to uh, focus in other climate legislation on transportation, a major producer of carbon dioxide. This is the broader issue of, of climate chaos on the energy efficiency of, of buildings, on conservation, on a rapid transition to renewable energy and a transition that will produce millions of good paying jobs. In addition to the Arctic Refuge Protection Act, uh, we should stop Arctic Ocean drilling. And there is a bill called Stop Arctic Ocean Drilling. Uh, we should uh, uh, pass the Keep in the Ground Act, my bill from uh, quite a few years ago that says we should quit doing public leases of our land, American-owned land. We, the citizens, own it uh, for the extraction of fossil fuels. This is something that actually uh, President Obama uh, came around to uh, after some merging over a couple of years to agree with and, and block additional leases. We should look again at the 100 by 50 Act where uh, we laid out, a group of us laid out uh, a, a plan to get to 100% carbon neutrality by 2050. It's something I had hoped that America would put a flag in the ground at the, the Paris uh, Climate Summit to say the whole world must do this. I think nation after nation is now reaching that conclusion. We need American par partnership with the world and, and, and leadership with the world to, to make that happen. Uh, and we need to do some other things like say with uh, international institutions that finance projects around the world, uh, we are not going to support them anymore if they are financing new fossil fuel uh, infrastructure. So that's yet another approach. So we should look at this at every possible angle, realizing that if you overhaul our energy infrastructure, we will create millions, millions of good paying jobs uh, benefiting families across this country. Great, thank you. So I appreciate um, all of the background information that you folks provided. As you know, we have a number of people watching this webinar and we'll also be sharing it with folks um, as a recording. So I wanna make sure we get to some of our um, guest questions. I have, uh, we have some folks in the background going through those. And um, my first question is for or the um, visitors, uh, our listeners at home. Uh, our first question is for Dr. Anstrup. Um, on, a, on a whole, so overall, polar bear populations, there's you know, 19 different subpopulations, they seem to be doing pretty well as right now. So why are we so worried? I think that's a really important question because we hear from people who would deny global warming and deny its impacts that, oh, 
polar bears are a flagship species for global warming and there still seems to be lots of them. Uh, well, what we are really concerned about is the continued warming and the future impact. In fact, we have several populations that are already declining as a result of global warming, some still holding their own, uh, but the problem is, and we recently published a paper showing this very clearly, that uh, population by population, they will begin to uh, tip over as the world continues to warm. So yes, the fact is that there are still populations that seem to be doing well. We should view that as a blessing that, hey, this means there still is a chance to save polar bears and we better get our act together to do it because the horizon shows us pretty clearly that uh, uh, they are uh, uh, going to disappear if we don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all the all the predictions you've your folks, your team was making, you know, 10 plus years ago have come to fruition. So we can we can believe the modeling that goes forward and shows the what the impacts will be. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Anna um, and it's for Senator Merkley. She's wondering which banks, if you can tell us, have actually refused to finance oil and gas development in Anwar. Anna, I would uh, be, be pleased. Uh, to uh, have my team email you a list of the 11. Uh, it's basically the 11 largest banks in America. <laughs> so when you think about that, the ones you see advertised all the time, those are the 11 that got the, uh, that got the letter. And the fact that all of them uh, agreed to do this is great. Uh, we're now worried about any uh, secondary financing from smaller banks. And of course, as I mentioned, in insurance companies. Uh, so um, I think... Um, uh, it's, uh, we'll get you the exact answer. We can post it on my website or we can send you an email. My staff is listening in and, but I don't have the full list in front of me, but it's all the majors you can, you can think of. Thank you. Okay. Our next question is from Elizabeth. Um, and she'd like to ask both panelists. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Amstrup, but the question is, we hear a lot about how far down the road we've gone. Is it too late to do anything about climate change? Have we passed a tipping point, Steve? Uh, no, absolutely not. And one of the things, the paper that you mentioned a little while ago, Amy, that we published in 2010 showed clearly that there isn't a tipping point between temperature and Arctic sea ice. That as temperatures rise, sea ice extent will decline, but not in a, a, a stepwise fashion where suddenly we have passed a tipping point. It's a linear relationship. And if we can hold temperature, if we can stop the rise of greenhouse gases in the, cons in the uh, atmosphere, we can halt the warming. And uh, you don't have to look very far to see the papers that have been published, the proposals that have been issued on how we can make that happen, how we actually can stop greenhouse gas rise in the atmosphere. So it's entirely possible and we just need to, we need to convert the plausibility to the real possibility with our action. Great, um, thank you. Senator Merkley, do you have anything you'd like to add to that question? Well, I, I would say that every moment of delay makes the situation so much worse. For example, uh, in that Arctic area where you have less ice, you have less uh, sun reflected into space. So the blue waters absorb more energy and accelerate the heating. Where you have frozen methane ice, uh, as the temperatures warm, it starts to thaw and bubble up. Methane is adds to the global warming uh, gases. Uh, so we obviously, that's not a good uh, development. Uh, and so uh, the time to act, what well, would have been great 50 years ago, it would have been great 30 years ago, but every bit we delay makes it worse. And so uh, there was never a moment to say we shouldn't act now because it's hopeless because every additional delay makes the situation so much worse for the planet. And we've only got one planet. Uh, it's estimated, the serious scientific estimates uh, are that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the earth. Uh, I thought that was just an expression until I looked it up to see the actual research on that. Uh, but we can't get to a habitable another planet. Uh, and um, if it ever, you know, it'll happen in fiction, it's not going to happen in reality in time to save our planet. We've got to make the changes 
right now. There was a, a Science Times article, I think it was in the Science Times um, uh, a week or two ago, about a period on the Earth where there were major lava flows uh, that triggered a lot of burning of stored carbon. Uh, and the results were we lost some 80% of the life uh, on our planet. Uh, we know that burning carbon, producing carbon dioxide, uh, warming the planet can have devastating consequences. So because we know that, we know we have to act right now. And we need to free Congress uh, from the grip of the fossil fuel industry to get that done. And so we can, on another occasion, we can talk about campaign finance reform uh, so that Congress can better serve uh, science and better serve the people. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I know we're um, we're getting a little tight on time. And one of the last questions that we had was about the um, contact information to submit comments. So we're gonna we're gonna um, put that up here shortly as I say goodbye. Um, and that is all the time we have for today, Senator Merkley. I know you have to run off to another appointment, but thank you so much for joining us today, um, Dr. Amstrup. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank all the folks at home, um, all the other viewers who've tuned in today, as well as all the people and organizations that are out there working to protect polar bears and helping us transition to a future of renewable energy. Uh, we'll also post this video on the Oregon Zoo's YouTube channel, um, and we encourage you to share it with anyone you think is interested in this important topic. Thanks again for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Doctor. Thank you, Amy.